Hello and welcome to ARCANET Wireless Emergency Intranet. I'm your speaker, Marcel Stieber, Alpha India 6, Mike Sierra. Thanks for joining us today. So quick introduction, my name is Marcel, AI6MS. I was first licensed 2008 as Kilo India 6, Quebec Delta Juliet, while I was a student at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in California. Um, I'm a hardware systems engineer in my day job, an electrical engineer by trade. And I'm very involved with the Cupertino Amateur Radio Emergency Services Group, the Cal Poly Amateur Radio Club, and several other local event groups and repeater groups for tower workdays, as you can see in the photo. Um, all my slides and other presentations are also available at my QRZ, so feel free to visit that if you're interested in seeing more. So today we're going to be talking about ARCnet, which is the wireless emergency intranet for the city of Cupertino in California. Uh, this forum will provide a kind of overview of what ARCnet is, uh, and talk about some of the design considerations, why we did it, and how we deployed our first few sector and client sites, and then take a look at some operational analysis at the end of the presentation. Um, so we'll kind of go through that step by step and give you an idea of what's going on. So a little bit of background to start off. Um, the city of Cupertino is about 60,000 residents located in the heart of Silicon Valley here in California. Uh, it's about 11 square miles uh, of area to cover. Uh, Cupertino Aries, the Amateur Radio Emergency Services Group, um, is one of the strong volunteer groups in the city of Cupertino um, with about 70 members uh, and our own UHF repeater, the W6TDM repeater. Um, back in 2012, the city did a technology roadmap assessment. Um, this is this report you can see on the bottom right. Um, and they sat down and came up with some conclusions for the city and said, hey, we'd like to find ways to use new technologies to supplement our emergency responses. So these are five of the points that came out with the key things that I'd like to call out here. The first one is that these Citizen Corps volunteers converge around these arcs. These are the shipping containers that are deployed around the city um, with uh, emergency supplies and resources to deploy into neighborhoods and help out the community members. Um, the third item here is uh, finding ways for the communications to be more timely and have higher quality. So and a big part of uh, an emergency response is having situational awareness. So the situational awareness in this case is improving that by using technology. Um, and then the last item that they really called out in this report was how to improve information sharing between the city, um, the field responders, and any other responders that may, may be helping with uh, the event as well. So how does ARCnet fit into this? How do we use that technology that they identified several years ago to help supplement the city's emergency response? Well, so ARCnet we came up with as an emergency wireless net network that connects all these locations together. So uh, whether that's other resources, other assets around the city, um, it can be used during emergencies by both the Citizen Corps volunteers or city staff, and it helps the city get more accurate and timely information during an emergency activation. So that's really the key things around that. Um, and the ways we can do that is using various forms of technology. So phone links, as silly as it sounds as an amateur radio group, providing landline phone links um, between different parts of the city is actually a really, really critical part of how to um, provide improved communication between uh, different resources within um, an emergency. So not everyone is an amateur radio operator, not everyone uh, will have an amateur radio operator at these sites when they need to make these communi this communication. So having phone links available is actually a really useful thing. Um, generally situational awareness, so having video monitoring, um, file sharing between the different sites and instant messaging can just be very helpful ways for the EOC to communicate with different departments or different um, parts of the emergency response. So next we'll talk about uh, the overall system design overview. So this is uh, kind of an overview of the city and you can see all these different dots. These are different parts of the uh, city's emergency systems and uh, just assets that they have. So uh, the blue ones are city buildings, the green ones are these arcs around the different parts of the city and the red ones are the fire stations. Um, for our network topology, we decided to use a point to multi-point technology. Um, this is uh, very similar to cellular networks or wireless ISPs, where you have a single site on a mountaintop or some high location, and then all the clients are talking to that primary site. 
So the good thing about that is you only have one sector site you need to deal with. So the routing is really easy. It's always from one client through the tower back to the other client. Um, you have lower latency as a result as well, since you only have one hop, as opposed to a mesh network or uh, some other routing protocols uh, or routing schemes, you may be bouncing through multiple different links and each of those has additional latency to it. Uh, the drawbacks, of course, is that you have a single sector site, so you have a single point of failure. So you have a single point of failure for the entire system. Um, in our case, you have fixed links between each of these sites, so they're just pointed line of sight at each other. Um, and as a result, you have concerns about making sure those links stay up. If a tree grows, if one of those antennas gets pushed out of alignment, um, you can lose that link pretty easily. Um, so pros and cons of this, uh, this definitely made the deployment a lot easier for us, uh, which is a primary reason why we did that. As far as equipment goes, um, two of the big players would be Ubiquity and Microtik. Um, in our case, we chose Microtik. This was several years ago when we kind of you have to pick one or the other. Um, and the primary reasons were really they had a really large selection and variety of different radios um, and router solutions uh, that were pretty cost effective. So you can see some of the pricing here. Um, these are a couple of their different uh, directional radio links that have routers built into them. And Microtik has a very, very powerful routing protocol. So they have their router OS, which runs on these and allows you to do extremely powerful networking um, and routing uh, you know, log, uh, algorithms or whatever you like with the system. So we chose Microtik. Um, going back and doing this again, I'm not sure I'd still choose Microtik. Um, it is very, very powerful, but as a result, it's also very difficult to um, teach others how to use, to maintain, and to really configure the way you want. So Ubiquity really wins on the kind of user interface side um, and usability. Uh, but doesn't have quite as many of the customizations. So it kind of depends on your application, which one would be better for you. So before we kicked off um, a whole bunch of money with the city, we did do a pilot program for them. So we bought a little bit of equipment and ran a test between our EOC, um, bounced off a fake sector site at our repeater location, and then went out to one of the arcs at one of the middle schools at the time. Um, looks like this, so the old shipping container, a uh, little mast with an antenna on it, uh, some solar panels and a battery box, and that's pretty much it. So we set this up at the, uh, at the uh, arc out at the middle school. Uh, and then in the EOC, we had this projection screen pulled down and pulled up, effectively did a Skype call for them uh, and demonstrated a live video stream and live audio stream. Uh, the key thing with all this was that this was completely off grid, minus the projector that was running off AC power in this case. But the city officials really recognized when we showed them this demonstration, the power of having this sort of link. Um, we told them, hey, you can turn off the internet to this building, you can turn off the power to this building, and that other site, it's literally sitting in the middle of a schoolyard with no power, no internet connectivity, nothing else, it's completely off-grid and still is working. And that's very powerful to have them tangibly see this and understand, hey, this is one of the really useful things. So we pointed that camera around and showed them the area and said, this would allow you in an emergency when the power is out, when the cell networks are out, when all the utilities are down, when your bridges are knocked out from the earthquake, you'd still be able to see, communicate, talk, and learn about what's going on at different parts of the city. So highly recommend pilot program, do something, test out, do a proof of concept um, before going and doing it yourself. Um, so the next most important thing for us was figuring out how to design and deploy this sector site, right? Um, if we look at uh, the city, we had all these uh, stars to coverage, right? We had to cover all these different stars on this map um, and had to cover all these different spots with a single site that could see all of them. Um, the key difficult ones were the two circled in red here um, because they were pretty close to the foothills, right? So if we look at this, you can see these two um, sites. This is a fire station and one of the arcs. Um, we're pretty close to the foothills, so you couldn't really do some of the sector sites further away because they wouldn't be able to see both of those sites. And in order to have that point to multi-point work, every single client site has to see that primary sector site. So in this case, um, we kind of took Google Maps and turned on terrain and went around in Google Earth and plotted out all these different spots, all these different green dots for potential sector sites um, and started plotting out and deciding you know, which of these would actually work. Right. Um, this one happens to be up at the nearby cement plant, uh, and you can see this was where the fire station was, and then uh, 
the school was uh, down here somewhere. Uh, so both of those would have coverage from this, as well as the rest of the city had um, pretty good coverage. Uh, this is using radio mobile uh, software free online uh, for amateur radio, so it's pretty useful. Um, this actual site, right up next to an old abandoned water tank, which was great because we could just drop the antenna on the side of it. Um, and this is the view from up there. So you can see these are all the stars from the sites we need to cover. Um, the other one's off to the right here. Um, and the longest link was about four and a half miles. So a lot of people always ask, well, how far are you going? Um, and how far can you go? Because range is always a question people ask with respect to radio. Uh, in this case, yeah, four and a half miles, that gets you to that furthest out site. Um, and then it was about a 40 degree beam width between the furthest north and the furthest south site. Um, and that's important when we select our equipment later. For the actual design methodology, um, a couple key things, these were kind of our tenets that we used when we were creating um, the system. So the first is commercial off the shelf or cot. So it was really important for us to have these not be custom homebrew, build it yourself PCBs that you have to custom program firmware onto and do like hand soldering or change things. Um, that's not scalable. It wouldn't allow us to work with other volunteers or allow other cities to model after our deployment. Um, and that repeatability was really key. Um, additionally, flexibility is really key. Having these things be off the shelf means that hey, if you need more solar power at one site, you just buy a bigger solar panel. If you need a better radio or more powerful radio or a narrower beam width, um, you can just buy different equipment to support that. So that was really important. And then lastly, um, well, I guess the second to last, the part 15 versus part 97. This question is always asked, uh, why are you, are you using amateur radio frequencies and why or why not? And in this case, we actually chose to go with part 15. So that's just the commercially available um, 5.8 gigahertz band for the backhaul. Um, and we chose not to use part 97. Now it's important to note that the equipment we selected is actually capable of part 97 operation. So if we did run into interference issues in the future or needed to increase our bandwidth or do something else, we could consider to part, switching to part 97 but we'd need to change some of our operations with respect to encryption and data rates and such. So um, it's just something to keep in mind what, when you need it and when you don't. In our particular instance, we didn't actually need to use amateur radio frequencies because we haven't had significant interference issues from uh, co-channel interference or other users in the same bands. Uh, but it's something we're definitely monitoring and want to keep an eye on. And then the last tenant, we talked about this earlier, is just off-grid and self-powered. So making sure for emergency services, for, an, um, for emergency communications systems, you need to be off-grid, redundant when all else fails. Um, so that was one of the key tenants. So all our sites are either fully off-grid with solar power or um, our battery backed up with generator uh, locally. So it, like the EOC has a backup generator for the whole building. Um, they wouldn't be in the building unless the power was running. So if our system went down, they, would, um, they wouldn't be in the building anyway. So it wouldn't be critical that that site was up, but they would um, get it running and then be able to use that. So for the sector site itself, it's actually pretty easy. Um, you pretty much need to power up a radio, radio and router combo at this site. So uh, we selected this Microtik uh, radio, which has a 90 degree beam width. So if you remember from our earlier slide, it was about 40 degrees beam width is what we needed um, between the northmost and southmost sites. So that was uh, great from that location. Um, and then some off-grid power solution. This one was literally off-grid. There was no power uh, nearby. The water tank is abandoned, so there's no utilities at all. Um, but that was great. It just a mountain top uh, or mountain side that we can just drop down a solar panel with some equipment in it. Um, documentation is key. <laughs> I'll say this a hundred more times during the presentation. Uh, documentation is key. So here you can see this is our setup. It's pretty simple. On the left, you have the solar panel, a solar controller, and then a battery. And then on the right here, we have uh, the 24 volt PoE injector that powers the actual Microtik radio and router, um, and then a DC to DC converter for an ethernet switch. And that's just for local, um, when we go to the site and plug in, um, that we can connect to the radio uh, directly. Um, this is, again, documentation just showing what it looks like. Um, and you'll see that this is a Unistrut frame with the solar panels, cinder blocks, and the equipment box behind it. Um, this was when we constructed it, actually building it up at the site, um, making sure that everything fits together and mounts nicely. Um, and then this is the actual radio on the top of the water tank. So it's only about 40 feet in the air, um, but it's sufficient. We just need line of sight to the rest of the city. This is inside the battery box, uh, one of the EP solar uh, tracers 
the solar controller here, the DC to DC, the Ethernet switch PoE injector, the two batteries for the 24 volt system, and the monitoring head. And that's pretty much it. The, it's nice and empty. We specifically over-designed this site um, to allow us to put a repeater or a link radio or a digipeter or weather station or other future expansions. But for the initial deployment, you really just need the power solution with solar control um, and then the actual radio. So that was uh, really nice. So this is a completed site. That's some of the crew members that helped deploy it that day. Um, Jim, Judy, Kenneth, Alan, and myself. Um, and it was really fun to go set that up. And this site's been running off-grid for uh, almost four years now um, and doing pretty well. So that's great to see. So switching over to the client sites, um, these are uh, the various client sites around the city. For this one, we'll talk particularly about the ARCs. These are the uh, shipping containers that are at several different locations around the city. Um, and we'll look at this one first. So this is uh, what a shipping container would look like, of course. Um, solar panel on the top, mast on the side. And then the key things we put at the site, again, it's the uplink radio that goes back to the sector site. So that's your connection to the network. Um, a local webcam, that's for situational awareness. And then the local access point. This is your wireless access point for all the local clients to connect to it. So any volunteer showing up with their laptop, tablet, um, phone uh, can connect to the network and be hooked up to ArcNet right away. Uh, use their SIP phone client, uh, browse the the other video cameras, whatever they need to do, use the messaging, uh, file transfer, etc. Um, so this is a list of equipment, won't go through it in detail, but pretty much the radio, the access point, the local analog telephone adapter, because we've got the phone inside as well, um, the camera, our power solution, very similar to the other sites, um, and then some network switch and just additional hardware to make it all work out. Again, documentation is key. Um, so this is inside versus outside of the uh, shipping container showing the different uh, colored Ethernet cables to make sure we know which one plugs into where because we've got different power domains. We've got passive PoE and active PoE, um, plus solar panels on the outside, um, and then uh, Cat5 cables going for both Ethernet connections and analog phone connections. So just really important to document everything really, really clearly. Here's what that site looks like. Um, here's the actual shipping container. You can see this 20-foot mast on the side. Uh, it's actually surprisingly difficult to source a 20-foot continuous mast. Um, you have to get it from the local metal shop with <laughs> minimum uh, order quantities, uh, so that gets interesting. Uh, here's our solar panel. Uh, it's mounted pretty steeply, uh, even though we're in just in California, the northern hemisphere, because uh, we need uh, off-grid. So we're doing off-grid, so it's got a pretty steep angle so that during the win winter you can maximize your power production. Um, I've got a talk on solar power if you're interested in that as well. And then this is the top of the mast. You've got your camera, your uh, nano station, uh, Pico station access point, um, and then the uplink radio going back to the sector site. Again, documentation. Uh, this is the power diagram. So the other one is the wiring diagram. This one's the power specifically. Very similar to the other site, solar panel, solar controller, battery bank here on the left. And then your various PoE injectors, the two passive ones for the radio and the Pico station. And then the active PoE injector for the webcam because those run at higher power. Um, unfortunately, we still need that 24 to 12 volt DC to DC converter just to power the analog telephone adapter and the ethernet switch to connect everything together. Um, as a trade-off, of course, whether you run at a higher or lower voltage for your solar system, the higher voltage solar system allows us to natively run the PoE um, for the radios and stuff, and those are the higher power devices, um, including the webcam as well, so that's that seemed to be the best solution for us. This is the inside of that uh, equipment cabinet inside the ARC. Uh, top shelf is all the networking gear. Um, bottom shelf is the uh, solar controller again, same one that the other site, um, and the two batteries at the bottom uh, everyone asks about the bricks here. No, the bricks are just there because they fit and they kind of hold everything in place. Uh, but yeah, neatly organized and label everything. So every single cable in here is labeled. In this one picture, we have three different voltage domains. We've got 12 volts, 24 volts, and 48 volts. Um, so it's really important to label that very, very clearly. Label what everything is, even if it should be obvious that this is a network switch, just label it network switch tell everyone that it's a 12 volt input, tell everyone that this is a telephone adapter and is a 12 volt input, label the PoE injectors as 24 volt, label their plugs as 24 volt, label the input as 24 volt. You get the idea, right? Um, the other thing to note is that this, this deck here has no power pole adapters on it at all. And that was very intentional. The last thing I wanted is to make a ham radio operator think that we could plug in 
uh, one of our radios into this this port this deck this deck here, right? So um, if you put a 12 volt adapter or a 12, if you put a, a power pole plug here, someone will plug in their radio to it. Someone will accidentally fry their uh, their mobile radio because they need to come in or just plug in something. So if you have different voltage domains, definitely use different plugs. Um, at least use different um, power pole orientations or colors at a very minimum. Um, but best is just to use non-standard connectors. Um, in this case, we're using barrel jacks for most of it um, and just labeling everything. And that's been really helpful. Uh, one last point on the client site before we uh, switch to the testing. Uh, this picture here is from the corner. This is where the mast was installed, if you'll remember. Um, this view right past this uh, pole here and right next to over these trees, that is the actual water tank that we're talking to. So you can, as you can see, getting a line of sight for 5.8 gigahertz is very difficult and is the most important consideration for your sites. If this shipping container were three feet to the left, you would not be able to reach the sector site um, so from this corner. So then you'd have to figure out, okay, do we mount it onto this, this mast here? Are we allowed to go up there? How do we get up there? Is it easier to maintain? Is it hard to maintain? Do we need a ladder truck to get up there? Um, those are really important operational questions that you just have to consider when you're working on one of these sites um, and how you actually deal with that. So uh, just something to think about. Um, and really, really critical. It's actually been a limiting factor for some of the other client sites we want to deploy. Um, not all of them have great line of sight. There have been trees that have grown over time. Um, and our client, our, our sector site is not very high. It's only a couple hundred feet higher in elevation um, than us. So one of the considerations is, do we want to move that site higher on the hillside? Um, is there some uh, authorization we can get to move up there? Um, and that's definitely in the playbooks for, for options. Okay, so the last section here is operational testing. Um, operational testing is usually done by sitting on a lawn and playing on your phone. Um, I'm only half joking because that's exactly what this photo is showing, uh, is myself and John KI6QDF sitting and testing out the uh, uh, PTZ camera that's mounted at the EOC. Um, but yeah, it's really important just uh, take screenshots and document everything. Um, when we're actually looking at the RF side of things, uh, this one is the one thing that you can check is the signal quality. So signal quality would just simply be the uh, signal noise ratio and the signal strengths that you're getting at each of your sites. So here are two examples. One is that De Anza arc. Um, so we're getting a good signal noise ratio of 53 dB with a pretty strong transmit signal. Um, and at the EOC, we're getting 57 dB, so a little bit better SNR, um, but a, a even higher transmit uh, signal. So that's actually really uh, nice to see. Uh, it is notable that we have different radios at the two sites, the QRT5 versus just the high gain, um, and those have different uh, gains to them as well and different beam widths. So that can make a difference depending on what your site is. If it's on a tall mast and moving a lot, you might want a, a wider beam width just to be able to deal with some of those fluctuations. But if it's further away or if it has, a, um, has more interference nearby, um, maybe a narrow beam width would be um, more uh, beneficial to reduce some of the co-channel co interference. Um, the other thing is important is to do some throughput testing. This was our very initial preliminary throughput testing that we did when we first deployed the site. Um, the first thing to do is just do one-way checks from a specific client site to the sector site. Um, and uh, you can use the built-in bandwidth tests that are in the, um, uh, uh, the router OS software that runs on the MicroTik radios. Um, so from the EOC to the sector site, you can see we're getting you know 25 megabits up and 16 megabits down. Um, that's pretty good. Uh, for the Dienza arc, we're getting you know a less transmit, um, and again, that's probably because of that interference between those masts that we're trying to get up to that uh, sector site. Um, but the receive is better, so it's got a, a probably a lower noise floor um, at the Dienza arc because it's further away from things, whereas the EOC is pointed right uh, past an apartment complex, which likely has a number of 5.8 point 5.8 gigahertz access points that may be uh, causing some interference. And then importantly, when you actually do a, a client to client test, so going from the EOC through the Lehigh sector site back to De Anza Arc, um, your bandwidth goes uh, l less than half, right? So uh, you're transmitting and receiving, you're going uh, through that sector site and, and it's doing both transmits at the same time. Um, so that's something to consider is what is your actual usable throughput 
and this is starting to get into the realm of you know video streams will clog this up very quickly if you're doing live video feeds from these sites or if you have multiple users at different sites all trying to access the same feeds so those are really important considerations to think about including where do you host all the data um, do you have everyone stream their videos up to the sector site and have a server there or do you have a server at the EOC um, if you want to store things and it's really a bandwidth question and a how you're going to use it question so that's just something to really think about um, here are a couple more test photos. So on the left here, there's one of the um, one of the phones that's mounted on the inside of the arcs. Um, you also see there are a couple extra ports here. So we have an extra phone port on the front for a second extension um, and two data ports. So if you're bringing laptops in or packet radio in, um, you can just plug them straight in and they're immediately hooked up to ArcNet, which is great. On the right, uh, this is the camera at the site. Right now it's just pointed down at the uh, entrance to the shipping container, so you can see if someone opens it. Um, a couple of us there testing it out. Um, and then the bottom picture is at night because it's got infrared as well. So very useful, just great way to see what the site looks like and um, check up on it. And then this is uh, some views from the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center, with the PTZ camera. Um, be very careful which PTZ cameras you buy and what their software support is and what their uh, kind of standard interface support is. So if they support uh, ONVIF or if they uh, only support their proprietary, uh, you know, Microsoft, uh, you know, some some specific program that only works in some specific browser or old uh, older Flash programs that might not be supported much longer. Um, it's just something to consider when you're purchasing equipment. Um, this particular camera works great, um, has really nice zoom, really great infrared, has um, all sorts of great abilities. That's that same picture, the grass photo earlier was taken from right about here. So it just gives you an idea of uh, how far that can zoom in. So, and then the future. Um, you know, this this system is is in its infancy. Um, we still, uh, we've been using it in a number of the CARES communication drills. That's a Cupertino Aries group. Um, we're working on expanding and optimizing applications, activating additional sites. We've had a number of other cities interested in interfacing with us. I um, mean, really it always comes down to well, what's the purpose? What's the point? Um, what are we actually trying to do? Uh, what is our service agreement? What is our service level agreement with other cities? What is the uh, intent? What are we actually trying to do with them? If we do interface with other cities, are we passaging, passing messages? Are we passing um, traffic? Are we passing videos? Are we connecting our phone exchanges to each other? What are we actually wanting to do? And I think it's always important that you start with the actual applications and then work backwards from that. So what are the things that we actually want to do with this? and then figure out how to do it. Um, just building the system and saying they will come, um, I don't think is a good use of our resources when there are a lot of other more important things like simple radio protocol training or getting everyone set up in the field with good battery backup solutions or with better uh, radio or net control training operations, right? Um, there are a lot of things that we can do in emergency communications. And I think it's really important that we think about what we're going to do with them um, before we just go out and build them. So that's all I had for you today. Um, thank you very much for joining this presentation. I do have some other presentations going on at the conference um, this weekend as well. So hopefully you'll enjoy those. Um, feel free to reach out to me, uh, my call sign at awrl.net, um, or you can visit my QRZ page uh, for any other information or questions that you might have. Thank you so much for joining and hope you have a wonderful conference.